So hello everybody and uh, welcome to this special session from uh, Cochrane Training, Cochrane Learning Live. My name's Chris Watts, I'm part of the learning and support team at Cochrane. Um, we're really pleased to um, be uh, starting a session, uh, a whole series of partnerships uh, with um, GESI, the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative, as part of the Learning Live program. So there's a, a number of sessions that are coming up that are starting off today with Professor John Lavis. I'm going to be handing you over in a second to Tamara Lotfi, who's a Secretariat Coordinator at um, GESI, to talk a bit more about the session and the program. From me, just a little bit of housekeeping. Those of you who are commonly um, have come to learning live sessions before, you'll be familiar with this. Um, for those of you who are new, um, a very warm welcome. Uh, this is how uh, we'll be running the session today. So, so John's going to be giving a presentation. There's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can ask your questions. This is what you'll see in front of you and your panel on uh, on GoToWebinar. You can submit a question to us down the side there. So if you if you type in a question, you can do this at any point during the webinar. Um, send that over to us. That gets logged for us, and we can take questions tomorrow. I'll be taking the questions and putting it together with John throughout the webinar. So um, send those over um, as you wish. Um, you can also raise your hand. So you're all muted so that you can focus focus on uh, what John's presenting. If you want to raise your hand and, and ask a question, you're very welcome to. Uh, there's a little uh, button down the side of your panel there with a little hand on it. If you click on that, that alerts us that you'd like to be unmuted to ask a question. Um, there's no pressure on either of these things. If, if, you, want to, if you want to ask um, a question, that's absolutely fine. In, in that way. So I'm now going to hand over to Tamara uh, to introduce the session. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for joining us today on this webinar. This is the first webinar we're hosting as Guest Secretariat, and we're very excited to have it in collaboration with the Cochrane Learning Live. And we would like to thank Dr. John Davis for uh, delivering the webinar today. So uh, John is a Canada Research Chair in Evidence-Informed Health Systems at McMaster University. He will describe the different types of policy and the different types of policy questions that systematic reviews can inform. He will then use a newly approved Cochrane uh, Knowledge Translation Framework to illustrate the many ways in which systematic reviews can be made more policy relevant. And um, the webinar will consist of a 40 minutes presentation and interspersed intersper with voting questions, followed by an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please uh, do send us our questions on uh, the toolbar on the right. And you can also raise your hand, just like Chris explained. John? Thanks very much, Chris and Tamara. Um, I see lots of people in the participant list uh, who could easily give this presentation instead of me. Um, so uh, I hope that at the end that uh, you'll see that I have a slide at the end saying, what have I missed? There might also be things that uh, people feel could be framed in a better way. So I look forward to hearing from participants uh, at the end. If there are questions as we go, don't hesitate to ask them and uh, tomorrow we'll bring them to my attention. So uh, in terms of conflicts of interest, uh, really they're, they're more in the area of professional engagement. There's no financial conflicts of interest. I am though involved in a number of the initiatives that I'll be mentioning uh, over the course of the presentation. So I just wanted to flag uh, those linkages. Um, so there's gonna be a number of polls, I think six in total, and then an open-ended question I'm gonna pose to you. The first uh, question, is please indicate where you're based. So if you can choose one for high income country, two for low and middle income country, and, and Chris will help us with that poll now. So that should all be there for everybody to see. Yeah, I can see people are answering that. Yeah. So we're about 60% high income country, about 40% low and middle income country with uh, just about nine tenths of you having voted. So that's very helpful to know, thank you. So let's move on to poll number two. So uh, unfortunately, the only uh, fault that we can find with GoToMeeting, the, the platform that Cochrane uses, is they only allow five-point responses. So I uh, used here the, the World Bank groupings of countries, but we had to lump together a group of disparate partners, <laughs> the Middle East and North Africa, South Africa and Canada, the US. But could people please respond with the region in which they're based?
So we have a very big other category, about 40% of you, uh, for another 40% roughly in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, unfortunately, no one from Africa, which is a shame, 7% uh, East Asian Pacific, 9% Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, we'll continue to, uh, uh, I'm sure Tamara and her colleagues at Gessie will continue to work to try to promote uh, these learning opportunities uh, in Africa and some of the low middle income countries that are not well represented today. So thank you for uh, voting in poll two. So I'll move on now to the overview. I'm, what I'm going to do is give a bit of context uh, first about what I think of as different types of policymakers, uh, and then make a point that I think many of you uh, will understand well, that policymakers have many questions, they need many types of syntheses, and of course they work in political worlds where many factors other than evidence uh, have big impacts on their decision making. Uh, but then what I'm going to do is use the Cochrane KT framework to try to identify the ways that we can make uh, systematic reviews more policy relevant. So you'll see a quick outline of that Cochrane KT framework, but I'm going to come back to that in more detail. So my next poll question is about how confident you are that you know your policymakers. So I'll let you define what that means. Uh, for say Andrea Yearwood, who's sitting in the Caribbean uh, Public Health Agency, she's thinking of of uh, chief medical officers of health, other policymakers and ministries of health across the Caribbean. For someone else, uh, like Sandy Oliver, who's sitting in the United Kingdom, she might think of her policymakers as being in part uh, policymakers in a ministry of education or other uh, parts of the UK government, but she also does work in low and middle income countries where she works with policymakers. So think about who your policymakers are that you're trying to influence. And then let us know how confident you are that you know them, the types of questions they have, the types of syntheses they need, and the types of factors that influence their decision making. So five options there about your confidence that you know your policymakers and the ways I've described. So with around 85% of you voting, uh, about just shy of half of you are somewhat confident, so second from the top. 8% um, of you are very confident, 21% uh, confident, and 17% not confident. So about half of you somewhat confident, so second highest from the top. And of course, this is incredibly challenging uh, if you're not inside government to know uh, the policy makers, what types of questions they have, and so on. So I think um, uh, very few of us would have a good handle on, on that, but I think it's very important uh, to have some working knowledge of the answers to those questions if you're trying to make your systematic reviews more policy relevant. So I'm now going to start to talk about the Cochrane KT framework. There's a couple of key pieces to it. I'm going to focus on the themes, but I just wanted to introduce the fact that the framework identifies four target audiences, uh, four reviews, and also identifies an array of intermediaries through which we can reach those target audiences. So in the policy world, the key intermediary would be journalists. So you'll see here consumers and citizens, practitioners, policymakers and managers, researchers and research funders. So today we're focused on that third uh, grouping, policymakers and to a lesser extent, healthcare managers. So I guess when I think about policymakers, and of course there's many, many, many types of them, but I tend to think in the health space of there being three broad types. And I think there are analogs to these outside of health. So in my world of health, I think about policy having to do with clinical programs and services or about drugs. So should we add this drug to a national formulary? Uh, should we introduce this service across the country? Then I think about policy having to do with public or population health programs and services. So this is when we're intervening on groups and populations with immunizations, for example, uh, campaigns to reduce obesity and so on. So the, the group, that, the, the focus here is groups and populations rather than individuals. And then there's a third type of policy, which is how do we organize ourselves to make sure that the right programs, services, and technologies get to the people who need them? What are the governance arrangements? Who can make what decisions? What are the financial arrangements? How does money flow? 
what are the delivery arrangements? Who is best positioned, for example, to deliver certain programs and services, and where should they be delivered? So there's an analog uh, in, in outside the health sector to, in the one case, program services and technologies for individuals, the second case, programs and services for populations, and the third case, the governance, financial, and delivery arrangements within which these programs and services are provided. So those to me are very different. I see in many, many countries that policy looks different for those three types of policy. So I think it's important to know where are you. Uh, many, many people in the health space are focused on policy about the clinical issues, and there would be many fewer at the opposite extreme focusing on policy about health system arrangements. So if I now go to some of the questions that can be answered by evidence syntheses, um, when people are in the policy about clinical issues space, the first of those three parts of the Venn diagram, uh, I find that those people are very used to what I think of as more clinical ways of thinking. Um, and so they would be much more likely to use something like the grade evidence to decision framework to inform, say, a decision about whether to add a drug to a formulary. So for those of you who don't know the GRADE framework, it has seven elements to it. Burden of condition, benefits and harms, values and preferences, and you can read the rest of the list. Um, there would be evidence syntheses about many of these. So we used to think about evidence syntheses really only being about benefits and harms, but increasingly we have them about values and preferences, for example. Uh, we also have them about equity issues. So it, there can be evidence syntheses that will address many of these, and those that work in this space might find the great evidence to decision framework helpful to think about where evidence syntheses map in to the types of questions policymakers may have. When we move to health system issues, I don't find um, that framework resonates as well with policymakers. We use a different one. Uh, I'm focusing here on the pieces of it where evidence syntheses can be helpful. So a big part of much policymaking about uh, system issues is fighting about causes of problems because we could have very different views about the causes of a problem and that will take us down very different policy paths in terms of which options we pursue. So evidence syntheses can help us make comparisons. Are problems getting bigger or worse over time? Are problems bigger or worse in some uh, countries than others among some groups within countries? And evidence syntheses, especially those involving qualitative studies, can help us understand how policy problems are framed in different ways by different groups. So just a, a topic like obesity would have many, many different frames within a policy lens, some which might be considered to be blame the victim type approaches, others would take a more societal perspective on the causes of the problem. When it comes to options, you'll see some parallels to the great evidence to decision framework. I think in the policy world though, more attention is paid to how and why interventions work because very often we want to uh, uh, take something that has been shown to be very effective in another country, but in putting it into our own systems, we end up adapting it uh, to make it fit within how our systems work. And so the process of evaluations uh, brought together into an evidence synthesis can be very helpful. And similarly, evidence syntheses about stakeholders' views and experiences with options can be very helpful, uh, particularly for politicians in understanding ending how have groups responded in the past when an option has been introduced. And then when we move to implementation, because of course having a policy on the books is, is uh, only a piece of the challenge, we also need to make sure that it's implemented in a way that the right programs and services, for example, reach those who need them. Here we have to be thinking about barriers and facilitators to implementation. Evidence syntheses again can be important. And if we're going to put a big focus on an implementation strategy to ensure a high degree of scale up, then we would want answers to the same questions about the implementation strategy that we asked of options, benefits and harms, cost effectiveness, how and why it would work, and so on. So those are some thoughts about the many questions uh, that might need to be asked. Then if we turn to the many types of evidence syntheses, so I'm just giving some examples here of the ones that we find policymakers to be the most interested in. 
Uh, so many of us, we, we picked this up from our colleagues in Uganda uh, and the in innovation then spread to uh, colleagues in Cameroon and Burkina Faso before we picked it up in Canada. But we find that policymakers are, are really uh, very keen on what we call rapid syntheses, which some of you might think of as rapid overviews of systematic reviews where we pull together uh, existing systematic reviews on a topic and we can provide more interpretation of applicability to the jurisdiction um, and other factors if we have more time. So the particular model we run uh, operates on 310 or 30 business days. Uh, Uganda has a slightly different model as does Cameroon. A second type of evidence synthesis that policymakers find very helpful is one that pulls everything together on a policy challenge, and that is specific to their context. So if we take a particular issue in Uganda, what for a particular policy problem and its, its causes is known? What do we know about the different options to address that problem and its causes? And what do we know about implementation considerations? So if evidence briefs are something that are widely used by evidence-informed policy networks uh, in many countries uh, around the world, and it's an input into a stakeholder dialogue or a policy dialogue, which I'll be talking about later. But the nice thing for policymakers here is everything in one place. Help me understand the problem. Help me understand options. Help me understand implementation so we can move forward. There are still, though, of course, other types of reviews. Uh, living reviews, increasingly common. Policymakers, I anticipate, as they become more prevalent, will love them because it means any time they need to go to a review, they're getting an updated version of the review. There are rapid forms of systematic reviews that might take uh, weeks or months instead of, of, of six months to, say, 18 months for a full review. And then, of course, full reviews. But we also see them on a range of questions. So historically, we saw them asking questions about benefits and harms. Increasingly, we see forms of evidence synthesis that help us frame, uh, sorry, that should say frame problems, not frame questions. The, one, the model that we use for that would be critical interpretive synthesis. For how and why questions, we have things like realist synthesis. So policymakers need many different types. Sometimes they want what's known really quickly on a topic. Sometimes they want everything on a policy problem, options, and implementation. Other times they want a very thorough understanding of what's known about a very particular question uh, that they're grappling with. So I'm now going to move to poll four to get a sense of how many evidence syntheses you have produced, but I would ask you not to count systematic reviews of effects. So, what types, how many evidence syntheses have you produced if you subtract out the systematic reviews of effects? So I'll leave you to pick one of those options. So we're at 60% voted. I'll just wait for a few more of you to vote. So we're coming up on 80%. Okay, so 45% uh, of you, none. 20% uh, 1 to 2, 24%, so about a quarter of you, 3 to 5, um, and then a, a remarkable 5%, 6 to 10, and 5% more than 10. So we have some people uh, on the call who've got a lot, have had a lot of experience with evidence syntheses um, apart from the more traditional systematic reviews of effects, which is great from a policy perspective because we need that diversity. So let's jump back to my slides. Um, policymakers need much more than evidence syntheses to make decisions. So as someone trained in political science, I'm very attentive to the, the fact that many factors influence policymaking. You'll see in the second bullet the framework that we use to understand those factors. It's called the 3I model. So there's the institutional factors, sometimes framed as constraints, uh, rules about who can make what decisions, for example. Uh, interest group pressure. Many groups in society want different things, and those groups will bring resources to bear on trying to influence decisions. Values, uh, so people's view about how the word world should work, more government uh, intervention or more market-based solutions, for example. And then, of course, there are other sources of ideas. So ideas would include research evidence, values, uh, and other things. All of those can influence the policy process. So that brings me then to our definition of 
evidence informed policy making. For me, what it is is using the best available data and research evidence, and by best available, I mean highest quality and most locally applicable to that jurisdiction, uh, systematically and transparently. So, my two favorite adverbs in the time available. So, sometimes policy decisions will get made in minutes and hours, other times in days and weeks, and sometimes there will be a very elaborate long term uh, policy development process. And of course, our, our use of evidence is going to look different depending on that time frame. And as you'll have heard me allude to before, I think using evidence in policy making isn't just about the benefits and harms of an option. It's also to inform what we understand about a problem and its causes, about things like how and why the option works in case we want to adapt it for a given country. And it's also about helping us think through implementation. But the main point is evidence syntheses are always only going to be one input to the decision. So I'm now going to move to the second part of the Cochrane KT framework. One part was the target audiences. We're focused on one of the four policymakers. The other part of the Cochrane KT framework are the themes. You'll see a sixth theme in the middle, effective and sustainable KT, uh, which of course is about how Cochrane as an entity can support that. I'm going to start in the top right corner, prioritization and co-production, and then work through the five briefly. So the first one, prioritization and co-production. If I had to pick a single one for making policy, uh, for making systematic reviews policy relevant, this would be the one. <clears throat> so this means, in plain language, producing syntheses that meet the needs of policymakers. And I'll take the two parts of this uh, separately. So first, prioritization. Ideally, what we want are systematic and transparent processes for eliciting the short, medium, and long-term priorities of policymakers. So let's say, for example, ones that can be addressed in six to uh, 12 weeks by an evidence brief, and then the, po the policy dialogue that it's, it informs, or say six to 12 months for a full systematic review. People should correct me if I'm wrong, um, at least in the space that I know, the only tool that is available, it's not yet published, it'll be coming out soon, which was developed by colleagues at the American University of Beirut, is the Spark tool for prioritizing review questions. It's in the particular domain of health policy and systems research, but with very minor modifications, it would be more generally relevant. Um, so that would be an example of a systematic and transparent uh, process. Um, if we now move to involving policymakers in all stages of the evidence synthesis process, some people call this integrated knowledge translation. The idea that as you undertake um, an evidence synthesis, you should be working with the ultimate users of it to help to articulate the question, to design the approach, to getting feedback on a draft, and then to figuring out how to support the use of the systematic review when it's done. So a concrete example would be in the AVIPNet group, uh, Evidence Informed Policy Networks, most of them in preparing an evidence brief would convene a steering committee that would include policymakers. They would conduct up to 20 key informant interviews on the terms of reference for the evidence brief to make sure the problem is framed appropriately, the options are appropriate to the setting before they begin searching for evidence. They would also engage policymakers as reviewers for the draft evidence brief. And later, something that'll come to again, the policy dialogue, they would engage them as dialogue participants where the evidence brief is considered alongside other factors. So that would be a particular example of a very thorough process of engaging policymakers in the synthesis process itself. So I'm now gonna go to poll five. And my question here is, how many evidence syntheses have you, been, have you been involved in where you've meaningfully involved at least one policymaker in its development? So I'll leave it to you to define meaningfully involved, but how many syntheses have you meaningfully involved policymakers in? So we'll just give folks a few minutes, 50% voted so far. Some of you on the call, like Sandy, are experts in this type of thing, so I'm sure the number for some of you will be more than 10. Okay, so we're at 80% voted, 50% of you said none, 20% um, of you said one to two, 20% three to five, around 6%, six to 10, and then 8% more than 10. 
So again, we have a, a diversity. Some of you might be answering no because you haven't been involved in, in systematic reviews to date, uh, whereas others might have been involved but not meaningfully involved policymakers. So it's challenging, no question. It can add time to the work, but my sense is it has a dramatic impact on the relevance of the ultimate synthesis. So now if we work, we're now moving around the circle of the Cochrane KT framework. If we now talk about packaging, push, and support to implementation, another way to say this would be ensuring policymakers receive and can act on evidence syntheses. Uh, two examples that I've, I'm giving here, one is preparing policymaker targeted summaries of, of systematic reviews that profile policy relevant information. Um, so uh, systematic reviews or evidence syntheses in general contain tons of information. Policy folks don't care about a lot of that content. They often are looking for very particular things and uh, groups like Cochrane Australia that profile that policy relevant information in a short summary of the evidence synthesis find that that is very helpful uh, for policymakers. Another example would be preparing evidence briefs on priority policy issues. So that would be another example of packaging the evidence, in this case multiple systematic reviews as well as single studies and local data about a problem options implementation. So a very different approach to packaging. Cochrane Australia packaging a single review and highlighting policy relevant information. The evidence brief profiling all the policy relevant information about a problem options and implementation. Second example I'd give here is designing and implementing proactive knowledge translation plans that address five questions. But you'll see between the two uh, M dashes, particularly when policy windows open. So one thing that's very important in the policy world is you might have an evidence synthesis that at the moment uh, is not on something that would be relevant to policymakers, but something changes and suddenly the issue rises to the agenda. And the question is, is are you prepared to now bring the review to pe people's attention? It might be six months old, it might be a year old, but now's the opportunity. So an example would be in a high income country like Canada right now, big focus on deaths re related to opioid use. Uh, reviews related to that topic six or 12 months ago might have gotten very little policy attention. Now the policy window is open and policymakers are clamoring uh, for evidence syntheses about how to deal with the opioid crisis. So the policy relevance shifts and uh, opportunity to make an impact is to recognize that shift and bring the synthesis to attention. And for us, these five questions are, are very helpful. What's the message for the policymaker? They don't care about the details of the review very often. What's the take home message? To whom should it be directed? Is this to the Chief Medical Officer of Health? Is this to someone in Cabinet Office? Is this to the political advisor to the Minister? By whom should it be delivered? Sometimes we as researchers, those of us, those of you on the line who are researchers, are not the best intermediary. We can often find uh, advocates in the community who, if we can arm them with the best evidence, are much better positioned to bring it to the attention of policymakers. How should it be delivered? could be a personalized face-to-face -face briefing. Uh, it could be other mechanisms, but certainly that face-to-face -face contact seems to be very helpful. And with what goal should it be delivered? Is this to help someone understand and better frame a problem? Is this to convince them to make a choice about one option over another? It's very important to be clear about what the goal is that's being uh, sought. So now if I move to poll six, um, please indicate the number of, uh, of evidence syntheses for which you've prepared a policymaker targeted summary. So even if you've never been involved in evidence synthesis production before, have you ever written a summary of an evidence synthesis that was targeted at policymakers? So I'll just give a, a few seconds for people to vote. So we're at 50% now. So I'll just wait till it gets a bit closer to 80. Okay, so we're now at 80% voted. Um, so about one third of you said none, about one third of you said one to two, and then from there it was 11%, uh, 11%, 11%, 6%. 
So some of you very active in this space, uh, others about a third of you haven't yet had the opportunity to do this. So thank you for the poll, for poll six. Now on to facilitating poll. So another way of saying this is growing policymakers' capacity to find and use relevant evidence syntheses. So here, one of the things that we can do are promote one-stop shops for pre-appraised evidence syntheses that highlight policy relevant information, provide links, sorry, I'm missing the word too, provide links to policymaker targeted summaries and offer free monthly evidence services. So I've given you three examples in the health space. So in the health space, access, for clinical questions, health evidence, for public health evidence, and then we have a database called Health Systems Evidence that functions in five languages about how we organize ourselves to get the right program services and drugs to those who need them. And in mid-September, uh, we'll be launching social systems evidence to cover many program and service areas, related system arrangements and implementation strategies. You'll see the long list of areas that we consider to be within the social system space, so education, uh, infrastructure, recreation, transportation, and so on. So these types of uh, shops are very helpful for policymakers. The evidence syntheses have already been appraised. The policy relevant information is being flagged. They can link out to a summary and they can sign up to receive any newly added evidence syntheses that are added to the database uh, each month. So now, if I continue with facilitating polls, some other things that, are, that I feel fall into this category are administering the rapid response service. I've talked about this before. For us, uh, in our space, this was an innovation that started in Uganda and then spread. Um, and then another example would be building capacity among policymakers to find and use policy relevance as evidence synthesis as part of their policy analysis work. So an example here that I'm familiar with would be the University of Johannesburg's building capacity to use research evidence uh, that's now called the Africa Center for Evidence that has focused on building capacity among policymakers to find and use evidence syntheses, which is hugely helpful uh, in terms of supporting the use of those syntheses. So finally, if we move on to the last of the groups, exchange, uh, another way of saying this is engaging with policymakers to support their use of policy relevant evidence syntheses. So I've foreshadowed this a few times with my talk of evidence briefs because these lead into policy dialogues where policy challenges can be discussed with those who will be involved in or affected by decisions. And I think there's three things that are very important uh, for me with policy dialogues. The term is used by many people to mean different things. For people like Avipnet Brazil, I think Jorge Barreto is on the line. What it means for people like him are that it's informed by a context-specific summary of what's known about a problem, options, implementation. And then the third bullet, that the de deliberations are facilitated in a way that draws out the tacit knowledge and real-world views, sorry, I have a typo, and experiences about the full range of factors that will influence decision making. So those three eyes that I talked about before, institutions, interests and ideas, and about next steps for different constituencies. One uh, thing that we have found very helpful uh, here in Canada that we've now added to the process is to also allow these dialogues to draw on the systematically and transparently elicited values and preferences of citizens. So we increasingly uh, convene one to three citizen panels uh, before we finalize the evidence brief. So policymakers have the best available evidence, they have the, the values and preferences of citizens, and then they have the insights of the people in the room on the day that can inform next steps. So it allows all of the inputs, evidence, citizen values, and the political factors to all come into play to inform a discussion about next steps. Sorry, I forgot that I had one last uh, slide, improving climate building demand. Uh, this is about advocating for evidence-informed decision-making. I've given four examples here of the types of things that we see in countries that are particularly good at using evidence syntheses, strong messages from all levels, performance criteria, checklists so you can't get to the minister or to cabinet without documenting how you found and used evidence syntheses, uh, external audits that brings to attention shortfalls in their use of evidence syntheses. And then finally, actually there are five journalists who highlight when government statements aren't supported by evidence synthesis and synthesis. And we had an excellent example of that for many years here in Canada with a, 
an online uh, online um, uh, article called Science Ish, which was part of our national news magazine. So let me conclude by saying that making evidence syntheses more policy relevant, in my view, means a couple of things. It means knowing your policymakers, types of questions they have, the types of synthesis they mean, and the factors that influence their decision making. So that, to me, is a critical ingredient to being policy relevant. Uh, and a, as a sidebar, as part of improving climate and building demand, we have to help policymakers understand those types of issues. So many of them don't realize that there are many questions they have that can be informed by evidence syntheses, that there are many types of evidence syntheses, and how those can be used in a political context. Second thing that's important to me, engaging in prioritization to ensure the syntheses are on the right topics and engaging in what some people call co-production. So having policymakers give input at all stages of the process to ensure the syntheses have the greatest chance of yielding the needed types of information. Third would be packaging evidence syntheses to highlight policy relevant information so policymakers can access what they need very quickly. And then the final is kind of a catch-all of engaging in other activities that help to get policy relevant evidence syntheses used. So push and support to implementation, especially when policy relevant shifts, when a window of opportunity opens, but also we need the facilitating pull, the one-stop shops, for example, the capacity building, and then the exchange with the dialogues, the chance to talk through what does the evidence mean alongside citizen values, alongside political factors in our jurisdiction at this particular moment in time. So that's the conclusion. Last question from me is not a poll. I'm hoping you'll enter it into the question box. What I'd like to hear is one thing that you're going to do better or differently in the coming year to make evidence syntheses more policy relevant. So again, many of you on the call do this exceptionally well. Is there one thing that you want to do even better in the coming year? For others on the call, this might be very new and you want to take one step towards making your evidence syntheses more policy relevant. So can people add into the question box one thing they're going to do better or differently? Chris, is that functionality enabled? Yeah, that's, that's those, I can start to see those coming through now, John, so, okay. yeah. So for me, am I, will I see them under questions or chat? They'll come under the questions, yeah. So if you, you should be able to um, undock the questions and you can start to see them coming through. Okay, I have to figure out how to give myself more space here. I'm only seeing one line at a time. So I see uh, one question going by about, can I send links to the one-stop shops on slide 19? Absolutely. So Willem, we'll make sure that uh, those go out through the Gessy network as a follow-up. I do have a final slide with some hyperlinks. I'm also happy for my slides to be distributed and you'll be able to click directly on the hyperlinks. So m many of the comments are really about involving policymakers um, in the process. So that, that key point about what some people call co-production. Um, some people saying put in more contextual information and trying citizen panels, which is very interesting. We found that to be a revelation, the citizen engagement alongside the, the, um, the evidence synthesis work. Look, so someone saying looking for policy windows, absolutely. Distinguishing short and long term. Sorry, I have such a, for some reason, such a short window. Distinguishing short term, long term quality uh, questions to manage expectations of what is possible, absolutely. More effective dissemination, more attention to packaging, super. So lots of very, very helpful questions. If it's, uh, what our plan is, is to have this uh, information available to Tamara and the Gessie team and our hope is that there will be some insights here that we can now use this also to help uh, better engage the Gessie 
the community. So thank you very much for your, your feedback on that question. Uh, the, the, my final slide is resources. So the Cochrane KT framework, uh, I find just very helpful uh, in, in helping people to understand how they can systematically think through how to better support the use of evidence syntheses. So if you access my, you can just Google it. Uh, in the original formulation, it was called Cochrane KT Strategy. My understanding is, so if you Google Cochrane KT Strategy, it will come up. My understanding is going forward, it will be called a framework. If you'd like a, a one pager on our approach to understanding a problem options implementation and how they line up to different types of evidence, um, then our finding and using research evidence one pager is available. Support tools are available. For those of you who are more in the system space, we have a taxonomy of arrangements. We'll soon have a version of that in the social system space. Um, and then we're just revamping a couple of our uh, key websites, uh, so the forum, and then we'll have increasingly material that is outside the health space uh, and social systems evidence will be launching in mid-September. So that's it for the presentation. As I said before, lots of experts on the call. I'm curious to know what have I missed, what have I got wrong, uh, or if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. So over to you, please. Uh, right in the question box. If you'd prefer to uh, speak, um, we can turn on your individual microphone. So you can put your hand up if you'd like to speak or you can insert questions into the question box. So we still have lots of time as promised, uh, 40 minutes presentation, 20 minutes discussion. So what have I missed? Comments, questions? Tomorrow while we're waiting for questions to come in, any um, uh, I think you're going to talk at the end about how this is the first in a series, is that right? Yes, John. So thank you for your presentation. I think it's very useful for all of us here, especially to all the guest network members. Um, we have Lawrence Osuat who has his hand, who has her, her hand raised, so I'm going to unmute Lawrence. Super. Lawrence? Lawrence, you... So let's leave Lawrence unmuted. Lawrence, if you work out the sound problem, feel free to speak up. Are there other questions, either written or you want to put your hand up to speak? Actually, I'm not able to unmute Lawrence. Can you try John or Chris maybe? I think maybe there's a there's a, yeah I, I can't unmute it either. So maybe Lawrence, if you put your if you put your question into the question box, I know we've got some questions coming at, um, from others. Okay, so we have a question from Gonzalo. How can you appraise and quantify how successful these efforts are when compared to no effort? Yep, so great points. Something we've struggled with for years. Um, so I guess when we look at our um, some of our interventions, like for example, the combination of an evidence brief and a policy dialogue, uh, we have two forms of evaluations. The so one is using the theory of planned behavior, people's intention to act on what was learned from the evidence brief and through the stakeholder, through the policy dialogue. Um, so that gives us a, a good sense of whether people, when they leave the room, uh, feel opposition to take action based on what was And with the theory of planned behavior, we also have access to three other variables that influence whether that is function I'm getting a lot of feedback. Am I alone on? Oh, there it stopped. Um, so that would be one. So that would be one. Sorry, I'm getting feedback again. Oh, sorry. I think tomorrow that might be your that might be your microphone if you mute while John's speaking. Okay. Uh, and then we also follow up, um, and Amanda Hamill's on the line who does this for us. But uh, uh, the other VIPnet teams do it in different ways. We typically follow up six to eight months later uh, with two questions. What actions did they take as an individual uh, and what actions are they aware that others have taken? 
Um, so the, that gives us a sense of intention and action. What it doesn't do as well is uh, we don't have a kind of counterfactual, what would have happened had we done nothing. Um, so we, uh, we don't yet, we have yet to kind of wrap our head around how we would design a trial for this type of thing or something that would get us closer uh, to a measure of effects. But we certainly have very strong evidence that these interventions lead to strong intentions to act and they lead to uh, many different types of action. And then we have anecdotal um, information about direct impacts on the policy process. And the reason why I say anecdotal is that sometimes it's very obvious. One week after the dialogue, a cabinet uh, releases a, a formal policy statement. Uh, and in other instances, decisions are made behind closed doors and we're never fully uh, aware of sometimes even the decision, but sometimes we know that the decision was taken, but we're not sure what factors influence the decision. So we have some very labor intensive case study work that's happened in many African countries um, and in some other jurisdictions that has looked at the, the impacts of some of these interventions using qualitative case study methods that again show impacts that are sometimes direct on the policy process and other times indirect by changing the factors that are influencing decision making. So for example, arming interest groups with effectively ammunition to advance their case. So it's a long-winded answer to say that I wish there was a simple uh, outcome measure that we could use. We use a variety and it depends on the nature of the intervention and we end up with different types of evidence that lead us to think that some of these are more promising than others. Of all of our evaluation work, uh, the thing that the evaluations to me tell me are that the evidence brief dialogue combination, especially now with the citizen panels, is the thing that has had by far the biggest impact on the policy processes that we've tried to support. So other questions? Yes, so um, we have uh, a question about maybe we could use social media as one way to disseminate this information and engage policymakers. I think it's more of a suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, I think we, uh, I know I, I can speak for our own group. I think we've come to realize that we have been far too slow in using social media uh, to bring, you know, kind of simple tips to attention, but also to push um, take home messages from evidence syntheses when policy windows open. Uh, so our, our group, uh, just as one example, uh, is increasingly going to be working with social media, uh, with different uh, individuals focused on different target audiences. So for example, uh, you know, one focused on health systems in Canada, one focused on health systems in low middle income countries another it'll be myself focused more on the social system space that we're going to be increasingly active in uh, and trying to really pay attention to the big uh, policy issues of the day and trying to respond in real time we do have a few uh, times where we've experimented with this in the narrowly defined aging space uh, we every morning at 9 a.m. run a, a, a search of all the previous days media coverage of aging and then if there is evidence on the topics covered by 3 p.m. that day, we send out a tweet about the to the original news coverage and then a second tweet to the evidence um, that speaks to that coverage. So we're trying within a single news cycle to say, well, here's what people are talking about, but here's what the evidence synthesis uh, on the topic says. So we've done some of this before, but we haven't done it at scale. But I, I certainly agree that we need to make uh, certainly our group uh, and I would imagine some others need to much more effectively use social media to make better use of evidence synthesis. Other questions? So the next question is, um, what are the differences between benefits and harms in the options part and implementation part? Well, I, uh, so they're different in that they're just focused on different things. So let's say that for a uh, given policy issue, um, I'm trying to think of a, a concrete example. Let's say the opioid crisis that many high-income countries are currently grappling with. Let's say that there was one policy option related to opening safe injection facilities where 
um, drug users can go and access clean needles and so on without fear of arrest. So you would want to know what are the benefits and harms of safe injection services. But then when you come to implementation, the issue about where you position those, where, you know, in what communities you put them in, um, how you work with the police to roll them out, how you work with citizen groups to roll them out, um, whether you publicly report on different aspects of their functioning, all of those are aspects of implementation. For a given implementation strategy, so let's say um, police community engagement processes related to the rollout of safe injection, you might want to look to see what are the benefits and harms of different ways of structuring policy community engagement processes. So they're both about benefits and harms, but one is about the benefit and harm of the policy option, and the other is the benefit and harm of the implementation strategy to make sure that policy option, if chosen, gets to the people who need it. Any other questions? Okay, so the next question is, um, it would be great if you can share about relative advantages and disadvantages and experiences with various formats of evidence briefs, policy briefs. I, I guess, you know, the funny thing is there's an excellent article by Tigreed Adam from the World Health Organization, and I, I can't remember the journal. I have health, the journal Health Policy in my head, but I might be wrong about that. But that term... Uh, um, Sorry, was it about uh, evidence brief or, or dialogues? Can you just remind me tomorrow? Briefs? Mm -hmm. Briefs and policy brief. briefs, yes. Yes, sorry. So that, that term, you know, policy brief means many things to different people. So there are groups out there that consider a policy brief to be a one paragraph summary of a single study. So when I talk about evidence briefs or policy briefs, I mean that very particular definition that I used before, which I'll, I'll move up to, um, about being context specific, pulling together systematic reviews and other types of evidence about a problem, options, and implementation. Um, and uh, where is it? I'm not finding it quickly, so but there's a, well, a quick summary of it. So that is for me what an evidence or a policy brief looks like. For those of us who use that kind of definition, I don't see a huge amount of variation. So whether it's Reach Policy Uganda or uh, Avipnet Argentina or the McMaster Health Forum or the uh, Knowledge to Policy Center at the American University of Beirut, they look more or less the same. They're, there's typically a summary of some type. Uganda varies a bit in having both a, a set of take-home messages and a three-page executive summary. The, we have a single-page summary. Um, uh, so most of them will have the you know the problem section, the options, implementation. There's not a huge amount of variability. I think the variability just comes from people using that phrase to mean very very different things. So, but for those of us using it in the way that I'm using it, um, I don't see a huge amount of variation, and that's probably because you know through a VIPnet, where you know there's a community of people across regions of the world that are collaborating and interacting periodically and learning from one another. So we sometimes see innovations coming in and say a policy brief from a VIPNET Brazil that will think, oh, you know what, we should start to do that in our own evidence briefs. So uh, I guess in any way, is there another question tomorrow? Otherwise, I'll make one other comment. I uh, actually have a couple of questions, but maybe we can address them and then share them with emails if, uh, if we don't have a lot of time. Absolutely. So what, what do you, to the, let's go ahead to the other questions. Okay, great. So um, we had a question about the access to the Spark tool, but I think you already mentioned that it's not published yet, it's under review. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. last, yeah, so my, it's in a revise and resubmit version. So, my understanding it will be in the public domain relatively quickly. And, and I'm sure through GESI, as soon as that's in the public domain, it will be sent out through the network. Definitely. Okay. So, um, in terms of engaging policymakers in the co production of evidence syntheses, how much involvement is too much? The concern is having policymakers biasing the type of evidence or results presented from the evidence. 
Yep. So excellent point. Um, so I guess our approach has has uh, always been to have a steering committee at the beginning that helps make big picture decisions, but we're always very clear with the steering committee that we reserve the right to make final decisions. So they are steering, but they don't have control at the end of the day over the particular decisions about which evidence is presented and how the evidence is presented. The key informants that we interview on the terms of reference for an evidence brief um, also have no direct control, so they're giving us their input um, and they would, they may or may not see the evidence brief before it ends up being published. Uh, the merits reviewers, like any reviewers, you can take or leave their comments. Uh, so if we agree with um, the input, then we act on it. If we don't, then we don't. Um, and then at the dialogue, uh, which is what the brief is prepared to inform, uh, people are welcome to, again, disagree and say, uh, you know, we, we don't agree with how you frame this aspect of the problem or we don't agree with how you summarize the evidence on this option. Because we go through this steering committee key informant and merit review process, we have never really had a case of our approach to the uh, presenting the evidence challenged at the dialogue. Um, and, and I think that just speaks to the fact that the more that you engage people early on, the less chance that you will run into trouble uh, when the evidence synthesis is, is ready for to see the light of day. I think if we were to have policymakers around the table helping to actually co-write the evidence brief, I can imagine we would end up in trouble. So I think some groups have had success with involving them much more directly in the uh, writing process, uh, that is not something that we have done. So it could be that we've drawn a line that has avoided some of those challenges, but it could also be in drawing that line that we've avoided some of the benefits that would accrue uh, from even more engagement than we currently have. So we have a particular place that we draw the line that gets away from the concern about over-involvement um, or trying to manipulate the evidence but others may not be in a position to do that. And I do agree that that can be a very uh, significant concern depending on uh, policymakers' respect for uh, you know, the role of independent science. Tamara, is there another question? So I think we covered the, um, so someone asked if we could comment on the possible tensions related to competing interests during co-production. Yeah, so I, I, I think that, that um, you know, it, it, where we have drawn the line, and, you know, again, there's many experts on the line. If folks have other uh, approaches, I know Sandy in particular has written extensively and, and given presentations about this, so she, uh, you, she might want to put in a link to one or more of her papers where she's talked about this. Um, so we have drawn the line in a very particular way. We want lots of diverse input but we do not want one or two people who have control over the language that gets used uh, in presenting the evidence. So we've chosen to manage uh, conflicting interests in a very uh, particular way. And there might be better ways uh, that we need to learn from other people about. So there's okay. another question. Yes, so we have, um, so the Cochrane framework identifies four target audiences plus intermediaries. How different, I'm sorry, how different is the approach if you are focusing on advocacy groups as intermediaries and not pure policymakers per se? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an excellent point. Um, you know, the, the, the two main intermediaries that get airtime in the Cochrane KT framework are guideline developers on the clinical side and journalists on the policy side. But, but of course, you know, advocacy groups are front and center. So um, in many of these debates, I, I, you know, I guess our approach, and again, I'm sure there are better ways of dealing with this, is that we um, share information with all people equally. We have no privileged relationship with either policymakers or advocacy groups. Uh, we will never take sides in any kind of a debate. Um, so we, but we, sh and we share the information with everyone. If they choose to use it in ways that we're not comfortable with, at the end of the day, 
you know, it's a, it, these are political battles being fought and we don't intervene in that process. We have audited things like government reports and it's quite conceivable we could do the same for advocacy groups to show whether there's a disconnect between the nature of their policy statements and the evidence syntheses that were available at the time the statements were made. Uh, and we've done that at the level of the World Health Organization as well, uh, which led to action. So I think that you know our approach is make it equally available to everyone, support all the groups that are trying to use evidence in decision making, don't take sides, and unless you're doing it in the course in the course of a formal research project, don't get into battles uh, with groups over particular issues. But again, that's where we've drawn the line. It's not necessarily the right solution for all groups, and there might be better ways of doing it. Okay, so um, thank you, John. One more. Um, is there a repository or a uh, recommendation where uh, we could see the types of policy briefs others have to be specific, be specifically, specifically, specifically all? So, Sorry, tomorrow. Yes, so the question starts with you mentioned seeing how different researchers in different countries write evidence briefs and integrating tools, strategies they have used to improve your own evidence synthesis. Is there a repository or recommendation where we could see the types of policy briefs others have created based specifically off of Cochrane reviews? Yeah, so I think, you know, most evidence briefs will end up drawing on Cochrane reviews because at least in our space, in the health space, if you're focused on, say, health system issues, about 25% of the health system reviews are Cochrane reviews. So all of our evidence briefs draw on Cochrane reviews. And because they tend to be higher quality than other reviews, they're often given disproportionate attention. Uh, we do provide evidence briefs in health systems evidence. So um, any evidence brief that we are aware of that meets our definition of evidence briefs will get added to health systems evidence. So you can go into that database, healthsystemsevidence.org, click on advanced search, click on document type, and then click on evidence brief, um, and then you'll see all of the evidence briefs. So you'll see ours from Canada, you'll see Georgie's briefs from Brazil, um, and as they are brought to our attention, they're added there. So as Avipnet Europe starts to produce evidence briefs, we'll be adding them as well uh, to health systems evidence. So that's the only repository that I'm aware of, uh, of evidence briefs. Once we launch social systems evidence, uh, if we start to see evidence briefs in the social systems space, then we'll also be adding them to social systems evidence. Tomorrow, I'm just worried, I think we've gone over time. Do you want to do a quick wrap up? And I'll just end by thanking Gessie very much for, for your leadership in this space. We're really grateful for the work that you uh, and your partners do. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. And thanks to Chris for thank you, uh, for this possible. So thank you, John. This was uh, very informative and I hope everyone uh, uh, was very happy about this. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can also send us, uh, send me an email, I can uh, send them to John. And uh, someone asked me again about the slides, we will be sharing the slides with all the uh, attendees. Um, and then I would like to also thank uh, Chris from the Cochrane Learning Live uh, for this collaboration. So as mentioned, this is the first webinar uh, in collaboration with Cochrane Learning Live, and we'll be having one uh, webinar per month for the GESI network uh, members, and that will also be advertised on the Cochrane Learning Live uh, website. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye.